Hello, everybody. Have I got a good word for you? But first, let me tell you a story. Uh, this man was 82 years old. He'd worked hard. He'd served well. He had lived probably what he might describe as a pretty good life. He served God in his profession for 50 years. But his later years, there was some turbulence. He battled skin cancer. Fifteen surgeries later, he suffered the pain, the, the, the scarring, and it was hard on him. Self-imposed social isolation. And in the midst of that very difficult chapter near the, near the end of his story here on earth, God began to speak to this man about the very same topic that we're going to talk about today. God began to push this man to choose joy. And at first the retired pastor said, I can't, I can't choose joy. So he gave up on the idea. But he's reading his Bible and he gets to John chapter 15 verse 11. And, and, and there we read that joy is a gift. And Jesus says, I want to give you my joy so that your joy may be complete. And this 82-year-old man reads those words and he, says, and, and, and he says to himself, a gift. And he didn't know what to do. So he got down on his knees and, and he didn't know what to say. So he, he just simply said, well, then Lord, give it to me. And suddenly as he described it, this incredible hunk of joy came from heaven and landed on him. And everything changed instantly. He starts dancing around his house. 82 years old and he was born again, again. And I tell you that story because I'm going to show you from the Bible that God wants you to experience joy. Whether you're 82 or, or 8. The good and pleasing and perfect will of God our Father is this, that you would be joyful. The Christmas story, the, the Christmas story glows with joy. Let me read you some Bible verses uh, about John the Baptist, who was a miracle baby. The angel spoke to his parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and, and the angel said to his parents, He will be, will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. In Luke chapter 2, verse 10, the angels show up in the night sky and they scare the shepherds almost silly. And the angel says to the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. The magi, the wise men traveling from the east, they see the star. Matthew chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. It says the star they had seen when it arose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. That is Jesus. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Listen, you can't escape it. If you read anything about the Christmas story, you realize it is a story that, that pulses with joy. It's wrapped in joy. Christmas equals joy because God wants you to be full of joy. God the Father wants you to experience joy. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 26, For to the one who pleases Him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, wants you to walk in joy. In John chapter 17, we eavesdrop on a prayer that Jesus the Son prays to God the Father. Let, notice what He prays. Jesus says, but now I'm coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they, that's you and I, may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Like what keeps Jesus awake at night? If, if there's, well, there's really no night where he's at, but what, what is the driving passion of Jesus that his people would experience his joy? And the Holy Spirit of God active in the world indwelling the people of Jesus 
nurtures and develops joy. You let the Holy Spirit have his way in your life. To use the Apostles Paul phrase, when you walk in, in the Spirit, that is you obey the Holy Spirit, here's what happens. There's, a, there's an effect, there's a fruit, there's an overflow to your life. And, and, and one, of the, one of the overflows of that is love. You love more. But another overflow is joy. Holy Spirit has, your, has His way in your life and you experience joy. God wants you to be full of joy. It is His will. It's His perfect plan that right now, wherever you're at, whatever circumstance you're enduring, regardless of the conditions that you have to, to wade through, God's heart desire is that you would be full of joy. But to have joy, you have to choose joy. Let's take a moment and define joy. When I was studying it, here, here are some of the phrases that helped me understand joy. Joy, first of all, is the anticipation of delight. Joy is a positive expectation. It is the sense of a coming good and a confident assumption of well-being. This is joy. I, I live with a uh, I, I live with a, a four year old. He just turned four. I forgot how intensely exciting Christmas is when you're four years old. You can barely keep him out of the Christmas tree. You think, what are you, a squirrel? They, they did, like your grandkids just hover with excitement because of Christmas. A, 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 a young man has a date on Friday night. It's the third date, and he knows this gal is special. In fact, he's already starting to think she might be the one. It's Wednesday. His, he, his boss is being difficult. The work is miserable. It's hot. It's, he, he doesn't notice any of that because all he thinks about is a date on Friday night with that special gal. Joy. Joy is future cast. And it's very, very different than happiness. If you confuse happiness with joy, I'm not sure you'll ever have either one. Happiness is all about circumstances. And let's face it, most of us can't control circumstances. Happiness is all about what happens to us. But joy is rooted in the victory of God. And as the conveyor belt of time moves us forward, it carries us closer and closer into the good and pleasing and delightful future of God. I read about a woman who always, who always turned to look at her husband before she would answer a question. He was controlling. It made her feel inept. She had what a counselor would describe as a learned helplessness. And, and this is the challenge of joy for many of us, is that too many times as followers of Jesus, we, we have a learned helplessness when it comes to joy. We, we, would say, we would say to somebody, listen, God wants you to be full of joy. And they would first look and they would turn and say, well, let me look at my circumstances and tell you if I can be full of joy. Let, let, me, let me look at, uh, at, at my checkbook and tell you if I can be full of joy. Let me examine the success of my children or, or how many likes I receive on social media. And the woman's learned helplessness had so much to do with her husband's poor behavior. And our learned helplessness grows out of this idea that that, that, uh, that, that, that worry and stress and anger and fear and pain have the right to be the defining circumstance. And instead of a learned helplessness, joy, joy as, 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 they, as they say on the Bible Project video, joy is an attitude we adopt. Jesus is with his people. He's broken the power of sin and death and the devil. And there's this future that he's leading us into. And it's the prospect of this future that backflows into our reality now. Listen, anything you would ever think about worrying about is smaller than Jesus. Anything that you'd think about fearing is smaller than Jesus. Those stressors, that pain, all of it is smaller than Jesus and his vision that he's leading you towards. C.S. Lewis, in one of, I think, his best essays, The Weight of Glory, 
has a powerful and very often quoted statement. Let me read this to you. C.S. Lewis says, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. When, when we don't choose joy, like God wants us to experience it, but we don't embrace it, by default, we're making mud pies. I'm not going to anticipate delight. I'm not going to look forward to this future good. I'm not going to think about the victory of God. I'm just going to let this problem shape my attitude. That's not, no, no, follower of Jesus, we borrow the words of Chuck Swindoll when he says to deliberately and diligently pursue joy. Joy is the attitude that we put on in every circumstance. I think about the words of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is an Old Testament prophet. He has a book in the Bible that lots of us have probably not turned to in years. Habakkuk received this vision of the future, and then he wrote about it in a song prayer, a Hebrew song prayer. No wonder we sometimes have trouble with parts of the Bible. It can be culturally removed. Habakkuk chapter 3 would be worth your attention reading the whole thing. Let me read a portion of this to you. Habakkuk, with this vision in mind, said, I trembled inside when I heard this. My lips quivered with fear. My legs gave way beneath me, and I shook in terror. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who invade us. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk who, said, Habakkuk, who says, no matter the circumstance, I will adopt the attitude of joy because I, it, 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 there, there, is, there is the veneer of sorrow and terror, but behind that is the victory of God. I remember I was visiting with uh, Ingrid's grandma down in the suburbs of Chicago. Happened to watch the news on WGN. I remember this so many years ago. There was a, a story about a senseless shooting. A little boy was killed, probably by a stray bullet. I can barely see the image in my mind. Maybe it was his father or his young grandfather. Maybe it was a mother or grandmother. It was a close family member, one who felt the sorrow most significantly. But I remember them saying on WGN, for all Chicago to hear, they quoted the book of Job. They quoted Job, and, they, and, 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 and this relative said, Though he slay me, yet will I praise him. And you hear what they did. They are looking at joy and defining the sorrow and the grief against the backdrop of the coming good because of the victory of Jesus. God wants you to be joyful. We have to choose it. We put it on. But how do we do that? I'm assuming that you want to be joyful. I'm assuming that you're willing to grab hold of it and wrestle it to the ground until you possess it. But how? So let me give you a quote and then a case study. And then we're going to simply pray a prayer that lets the Father know that we want all the joy that He's reserved for us. So first, the quote. This comes from a Bible commentary on the book of Colossians by Brian Walsh and Sylvia Kiesmott. And they make this interesting observation. They wrote, Indeed, vanquished peoples are not really subjects of the empire until their imagination has been taken captive. 
So, so the challenge of joy, if you said, Ben, I want to grab hold of all the joy that, that Jesus has set for me, the challenge of joy is that we have to repeatedly salt every experience with the awareness of the victory of God, the blessing of God, the promise of God. How do we do that? And, and really to answer, how do we do that? We go back to this quote by Walsh and, and Kiesma, and I would say, where do we do it? See, the first context of joy is always our imagination. We are never a slave to worry or fear or anger or pain. Or We're never a slave until our minds have been taken captive. Joy will always be the result of where we focus the mind's eye. So some of you can remember this on really old TVs. There was a couple of knobs, and you could adjust the contrast with the one knob. You could adjust, adjust the color with a knob. And, and, and to be joyful means that we've allowed the anticipation of, and delight of God's future, we, we, we've allowed the future of God to adjust our knob so that everything we see, we see through the lens of this coming future. And it gives us joy. We see aging through the lens of the victory of Jesus and what he has in store for us. We interpret sacrifice. We, we think about how we think about people that despise us and they say bad things about us. And we see that through the lens of, of this coming good that God has for his people. And it allows us, regardless of the circumstance, to live with a delight and an expectation of good. So, Let's do a case study. Let me show you how this works out in real life. Then I'll pray. Then, then, then we'll pray together. And this is from doctors Gary Lovejoy and Gregory Knopf. And they're actually, this is from a book on depression of all things, but it's a case study. And, uh, and you'll notice that you can actually exchange some of the details, and, but the principle is still the same. The author is right. Say you went for a job interview and you were turned down for the job. By the time you... Get home, your disappointment has left you depressed. If I were to ask you why you're depressed, you would tell me that it was because you failed to get the job you wanted. But actually, that wouldn't be why you're depressed. You're depressed because of your beliefs about being turned down for the job. You'd be telling yourself that not getting this job proves you'll never get the job you want. Now that thought, if you believed it, that you'll never get the job you want, that would be depressing. Some people are going to have the same experience you did. They didn't get the job they wanted, but they respond very differently. That's because they would be thinking that though not getting this particular job is disappointing, that there are other good jobs out there and eventually they'll get the job they want. The difference in emotional response is attributed to the difference in beliefs about the experience. So the authors put this in an ABC format. This is so helpful. The ABCs of your response. The activating event, in this example, not getting the job, triggers a belief. You can believe that there's something wrong with you and you'll never get the job, or you can believe that there are plenty of jobs out there and eventually you'll get one. So the activating event triggers a belief about that event, which then produces a certain emotional and behavioral consequence. I'm suggesting to you that God's desire, God has set circumstances, He's arranged the future so that, so that a positive expectation of good, an anticipation of delight, assuming that, 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 that life indeed that God has set before you is, is delightful. Like, like there's a reason we can be joyful. But if we're going to experience all the joy that Jesus has won for us on the cross and that God wants for us, the Spirit is working us, if, if that joy is going to be a reality in our life, then the responsibility for us as, as Spirit-indwelled believers is to truthfully interpret these activating events, to interpret them through the lens of, of the victory of God, which means that, when, that, 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 that what we believe about ourselves and what we believe about the future, shaped by heaven, ultimately will produce joy. It's a big concept, ABC. 
Take out the particulars. Maybe, maybe it's not about getting a job, but maybe it's about being intensely lonely. Maybe it's injustice in your life and it doesn't make you depressed. It makes you angry. The particulars you can change out however you want. The challenge for us as believers is, let, is to let the truth of the victory of Jesus backflow, filter back into our present life now, causing us to anticipate with delight. And we purposely and we prayerfully, we interpret our experiences through the lens of joy. And we say things like, I don't like this. But you know what? I know it's going to end well. This hurts. But I know God is working for the larger good. I'm so scared. The fear almost feels paralyzing. But, but there is this delight that I am anticipating. Listen, I, I opened up with a story of a retired pastor. He's 82 years old, and he prayed for the gift of joy, and God instantly gave it to him. And when we close in prayer, I want you to pray that prayer. Some of you, God may instantly, dramatically, radically give you the gift of joy. I suspect for most of us, though, we have to wrestle for it. That God wants us in the process of wrestling with it to, to build our faith muscles. I want you to get this, number one, that God wants you to experience joy. So number two, choose it. And you do that by really paying attention and managing well your imagination, that mind's eye, and see your life through the lens of the victory of Jesus. So let's pray together. You're going to pray. I'm going to pray. We're asking for joy. Jesus, we come to you. We come to your Father because of the blood uh, you, that you shed for us on the cross. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would shape our prayer time even now. Father, my prayer is that you would give us your joy, that you would not let, let us settle for pessimism, for anger, for negativity, for gloominess. God, that, that, if, that if we're a spiritual Eeyore, that you would um, do what it takes to let us have the joy of heaven. God, I'm praying for an instant transformation that you would instantly give us joy. But we recognize that you're God and we're not. And if you don't give it to us instantly, then God, Luke 18, 1, we must always pray and never give up. We're going to wrestle, wrestle you with for this. And, and, and God, we want joy. So let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. A, a blessing and a benediction. Thanks for joining us through the magic of video. I look forward, I really look forward to connecting with you in person. If there's ways that we can serve you, uh, pray for you specifically, maybe there's some needs you have there. Is, I, I just want to encourage you to get a hold of the River Church. The contact information is here on the screen. Send a message through Facebook. The point is, if you have a need, and maybe we can fill it, uh, but you just have to ask. So a, ben a benediction, a blessing from Romans 15. 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.